Brothers and sisters in Christ, may the hope of promise of resurrection and the Holy Spirit dwell with you always. Amen. In the 1950s, there was a radio show hosted by Edward Murrow called This I Believe. During this program, Murrow would invite famous people like Eleanor Roosevelt and Helen Keller and Jackie Robinson, but he'd also invite the less famous people like cab drivers and business people, scientists and secretaries. And he'd ask them to share a short essay about the guiding principles of their lives and professions. Murrow's goal was to bring hope to a nation that was worried about the Cold War and McCarthyism and racial strife. This program was reborn in 2004, and it shares many of these same goals, to bring hope and optimism in a world that can so easily give in to a rhetoric of despair. While these essays are not specifically religious, many of them do have religious undertones and are influenced by faith. There are essays about encountering people of other cultures, about the power of kindness, about what it's like to get old, and why we are living here on this planet in the first place. The program gives guidelines about these essays for those who would like to contribute. They encourage the writers to first tell a story, Tell a narrative, not just list what you believe, but tell a real-life story about living that experience, something from their lives or their work or their family. It doesn't have to be heart-wrenching or gut heartwarming or gut-wrenching. It could even be funny, but they want you to be real and share something personal from you. They want you to be brief. The shorter, the better. It helps you get to the point. They want you to name your belief in a simple statement. If you can't name it in just a few words, then it's something probably bigger than a belief, more complex than a belief. They want you to be positive. So much in our lives, we are surrounded by negative comments and views and thoughts, and I've heard people try to explain, explain what they believe by tearing down what others believe and degrading them. That's not what they're, this is about, and that's not what they're looking for as they share their beliefs. And finally, they tell them to be personal, to use their own language, to use words that make sense to them, that so makes it sound like them. And so often when we are asked about what we are know, I think we condition ourselves to regurgitate and repeat back facts and sound bites that we hear. But what is it that we truly believe? That's at the core of this program. What is it that we take to heart that helps shape our daily lives and our interactions with other people? We in the church are no less guilty of this. Creeds are certainly useful and important, but what purpose do creeds hold for us unless they truly cause us to ask, how is God working in our life? How do we see God at work in others? How do we see God at work in this world? And how does it drive us to change our perspectives and our behavior? In our chapter of the story today, based on the beginning of the book of Acts, we see the power of the early church that comes from a shared belief. Before blogs and Facebook, Pinterest and Instagram, TV specials, and yes, even before radio shows, the disciples in Acts are sharing what they believe. And they live out this belief in their daily lives. The events of post-resurrection, Jesus and the disciples come first at fast. First they come really fast at first. There we go. After Jesus rises on Easter Sunday, he stays around for 40 days, showing up at different places and to different people, proving that truly he is alive, he is risen. And then comes the ascension when he ascends up into the heavens and he empowers his disciples that, to continue on the ministry that he began. And as he leaves, he promises them that they will not be alone that soon the Spirit of God will come upon them and journey with them. And ten days after the ascension on Pentecost, the Holy Spirit does come like wildfire. The book of Acts documents the aftermath of Christ rising from the dead, ascending to heaven, and the coming of the Holy Spirit. The book of Acts is a story about Christ's church figuring out exactly what it is they're supposed to do next. And it 
documents the success that they do have. And at the center of their message, at the center of their community, was the hope that they found in the resurrected Christ. In the face of an imperfect world, there was the promise of new life. In the face of death and despair, there's resurrection hope. In the face of imprisonment and beatings, Christ's resurrection helps carry them through. God's promise and hope in Jesus Christ would endure and carry on through these early followers, helping the church take root and to grow and to spread this message of life, new life, resurrected life. Headlining this movement, at least at the beginning, is Peter. You remember him, right? This rock upon whom Christ will build a church, but we know who ends up denying and abandoning Jesus. Some rock, huh? Peter is restored by the risen Christ. And Jesus tells him, Peter, do you love me? And he says, yes, three times. And then Jesus tells him, feed my sheep. And Peter jumps into this role wholeheartedly. He continually talks about resurrection hope in all that he does and acts, even when he's threatened with jail and death. Except for when he doesn't. Because one particular story stands out for me in Acts. It's in chapter 10. It's the story of Peter and Cornelius. You see, Peter, one might say, was a little stuck in his ways. Maybe just a little bit stubborn. For him, he was a proud Jewish follower of Jesus, and it was initially hard for him to welcome in new people, especially those who weren't like him. And so when the non-Jews started joining this movement and converting him, converting it caused in him a crisis why because they were impure they didn't follow the same laws they were different yes peter had heard and witnessed all the things that jesus had taught and lived and Jesus's welcome of outsiders and still peter had a hard time letting go the things he held on to that separated himself from these others and so god he appears to cornelius and a roman soldier who had become who, who's a roman soldier who turned into a Christ follower. And God tells Peter and Cornelius, go eat together. Go eat together. Not just eat, but you see in the picture all the things that they were told not to eat in the first place. Things like pigs and snakes and the weird hoofed animals that they weren't supposed to eat because of the Old Testament laws. And Peter, it kind of woke him up. It was a slap to the face. It was a renewed sense of what God might say new life looks like for him. What God had once declared unclean is now clean through the power of the resurrected Christ. And because of this, the message of Christ is not just held on to a select group of people, but is spread out and meant for the entire world. Peter, Thomas, Mary, Stephen, the rest of the early church, they shared this belief. They shared their belief in this resurrecting power throughout their lives, that Jesus was risen and that this offered them something new to bring to this world. They weren't perfect people. And sometimes God did need to challenge their stubbornness, but they were people filled with resurrection hope and the Spirit of God used them. Their messages and their stories of belief spread and grew and brought about new life into the lives of those they encountered, but also new life into the places where their hearts were hardened. If you were asked, how would you explain about belief in resurrection for you? If you were asked why resurrection is important for you, how might you respond for your own lives? And as you think about this, I want you to remember those guidelines from that essay, from this I believe, about telling a story, about being brief, about just naming your belief, to being positive and being personal. How would you tell about resurrection life and how God has shown up for you? Not just recycled church language, but language that is your language about God interacting with your stories, about how God has shown up for you, about how God has given you new life, about God has challenged your assumptions of other people. 
How has the risen Christ made a difference in your life as we continue to live out our stories and God's story? It's 2,000 years later since the ascension, but we continue to be resurrected people in a world that desperately needs to hear stories of hope, of new life, of risen Jesus. May God continue to help us share the hope that we receive in the risen Christ now, always, forever. Amen.